So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, session on uh, dealing with uh, CSF leaks or skull base defects. Um, we were not able to deal with or to close. Uh, may I ask for the uh, my first slide, please? I will give a, give a short introduction into the material so that we are somehow <coughs> situated on what's going on. And uh, we have uh, a couple of speakers here who have been included uh, in this round table and uh, seem to be huge experts on having uh, uh, CSF leaks on the long term. We will see how they are going to deal with this. Uh, we have Raj Bala from uh, Manchester. We have uh, Yanis Konstantinidis from uh, Thessaloniki, Greece. We have Andrei Lopatin from Moscow. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Manea from uh, Romania, uh, Brand Senior from uh, US uh, at Chapel Hill, and uh, Eric Wang from uh, Pittsburgh. And I have asked and each of them to prepare at least two cases on their own, explaining where they had problems, uh, presenting slides, presenting the um, the uh, clinical history, and then put questions uh, to the uh, panelists. I will be moderating their conflicts and then ask you to participate or to put questions to the panelists or to the presenter. I hope that is going to be as entertaining as possible. Um, now, uh, before we have the first case, let me go back to literature to uh, assess what was going on. Uh, regarding CSF leaks uh, um, in the past 20 years, and you will see that bacterial meningitis is a potential risk when you ever have uh, an active or more complicated um, intermittent CSF leak. And um, this was published uh, that you still have a certain amount of risk. We will come to that back later. But there were cases after trauma who had had survived uh, craniofacial trauma and then developed ascending bacterial meningitis up to 20 years later. There are some statistics uh, showing that um, conservative management of CSF leak uh, is as successful as up to 50%, and that means 50% failure. So um, conservative management, at least from my point of view, is uh, not an option particularly if you consider that the risk of suffering uh, bacterial meningitis with that conservative treatment is up to 18.5% uh, at least uh, in the first years, and we published that in Rhinology uh, some years ago. Now, this is uh, considering that uh, the accumulative risk of suffering from a bacterial meningitis is uh, about 8.5% per year, and that is adding. That means after 10 years, you have a CSF leak, the risk of bacterial meningitis is pretty high. And considering that despite living in an antibiotic era, we still have a high mortality rate, and considering that going endoscopically at the skull base, making a reconstruction and closing these defects, uh, reduces that risk down to 100% if you uh, succeed with a closure and reconstruction. We think that um, the uh, reconstruction of the skull base defects and closure of the CSF leaks is the only alternative, at least from my point of view. Now, if you now check the results, there have been uh, uh, papers dealing with that, the results after primary surgery of uh, closure of CSF leak is between 75 and 100%. Uh, the problem is that um, it will strongly depend on the size of the defect first. That is one of the major uh, criterion to uh, succeed with a, a closure. Uh, however, these series usually are very difficult to compare because the indications were completely different. It's not the same doing uh, trauma surgery or tumor surgery or just FES and skull base surgery. Mid different materials were used, we can discuss that as well, and also the follow-up uh, were completely different, so it's difficult to compare. Nevertheless, there has been a couple of uh, facts which showed when you are at risk of uh, having a failure of this construction. 
uh, first of all, underestimating the defect that usually uh, occurs when you're dealing with trauma cases. Uh, high flow CSF, we have seen that when you open the third ventricle, you do uh, a tumor surgery in that, and if you do not a proper reconstruction of the skull base, the risks are higher. You have increased intracranial pressure that can produce not only a recurrence of your good reconstruction, but also a second or a third CSF leak, for example, in obese ladies with uh, benign intracranial hypertension. And then there may be other facts I want to hear from my panelists here. So going back to uh, the topics we are discussing uh, uh, along this afternoon is that we think that CSF leaks need to be closed in order to reduce the risk of ascending bacterial meningitis. Hegarcy started um, uh, studied that uh, in a meta-analysis showing that at first attempt the closure rate was 90, at second 95. Uh, also uh, Harvey uh, studied uh, years later a systematic review on large skull base defect showing that at first attempt the closure rate was high, in the second uh, attempt it was even increased. But that means, on following both papers, at least these two, that there is a risk of failure rate. And that failure rate may be low, three, four, five percent, but there is a failure rate. And that is exactly what we are going to discuss today. When did we fail? Why did we fail? How did we handle that? And what would be recommendations for you or for the panelists or for me to learn out of these cases? And that's why we have here our panelists. So these case reports will be hopefully uh, um, leading to conclusions that uh, may allow us to take home messages for our daily practice. Said that, uh, I'd like to ask now Brent uh, Senior from uh, North Carolina Chapel, at Chapel Hill to do his uh, two first cases and uh, proceed. Thanks, Brent. Oh, perfect, thank you. Green. Oh, mine's green too. <laughs> well, it's a great honor to be able to uh, speak with you and to be invited to this, uh, this Congress. Uh, though I have to admit, I don't know how much of an honor it is to be asked to speak on failure. I don't know what kind of a reputation I have out there, but here we go. Uh, this is my, my first case. This is a, a failure because I never got a chance to close it. 33-year-old woman who presented with complaints of nasal drainage from the left side. She'd been seen by a colleague while I was out of town. She'd had sinus surgery and septos, uh, septal surgery about 18 months earlier. She developed recurrent headaches that led to a second sinus surgery by the same surgeon three months before she came to us. And then uh, persistent headaches following that procedure led to obtaining an MRI one month later, so two months prior to coming to us. And she presents to the colleague. And so this is her CT scan that we had from prior to surgery. So she has pretty diffuse disease on both sides there with some septal deviation. Now this is uh, uh, following her first uh, operation in eight months before she came to me. So I, I just point out, the, the, the read from the radiologist on this particular x-ray was this normal post-operative sinuses. That's what the read was from the radiologist. No abnormalities, according to the radiologist. Panel, any abnormalities that you're seeing? <laughs> now, unfortunately, the, the surgeon also notes in their clinical notes that there were no abnormalities, just uh, uh, some mucosal thickening in the sinuses. So uh, the, the, that uh, case led to an operation on the sinuses, that uh, CT scan, for more sinusitis. That was the indication for the operation. And then the, because the headaches didn't improve, the, the doctor got an MRI after that second operation. So MRI shows a meningoencephalocele coming down into the sinus cavity on the left side. Official read, normal post-operative sinuses. 
Unbelievable. Okay, patient refers to me with concern for CSF leak on February 10th, beta 2 transferrin is sent. Um, we didn't have the films to review, just so you know. That was based on an endoscopy and based on the liquid coming from her nose. Her nose, uh, uh, the test is positive. Patient's notified, surgery is arranged for February 22nd, add on best time. So that means it's not my surgical day. I had to add it on to the end of the day, find a time, the operating room finds me a time. Patient uh, presents to the emergency department on the morning of the, sur the planned surgery day with severe headache and photophobia. She has florid meningitis. She rapidly decompensates despite aggressive intensive care. She herniates within two hours, becomes locked in, and dies several weeks later related to respiratory complication. Difficult case. So, you know, my, my, this patient clearly had evidence of encephalocele and CSF leak at least 15 months prior to presentation. And she had evidence of leakage that was continuing during that entire time. And it appears to have been missed on by the radiologist, or maybe there was some other shenanigans going on. I don't know. Missed on MRI, missed on CT scan. So the questions I had for the panel is when do you per, uh, perform a CSF leak and encephalocele repair? Is it something that you do emergently? immediately that day? Is it something that you do urgently within a few days? Is it a next available type time slot? Do you make a difference between a traumatic or iatrogenic versus a spontaneous type leak? Do you perform them late at night as an emergency add-on, which I personally find to be very frustrating because I don't have nursing care or anybody that can help me with these operations? And then what do you feel the incidence of meningitis is in the presence of CSF rhinorrhea in your experience? We've seen what the data says. What do you feel in your practice? Can I ask questions of my uh, panels? Do we have the uh, microphone? Whoever wants to start, feel free. I'd appreciate your comments on this. Thanks, Brent. Raj Bala, uh, work in Manchester, um, tertiary practice, so seeing cases like, uh, uh, like you've described. I don't perform uh, the case as an emergency. Um, I think you've made a great point in that uh, you don't have your regular theatre team. You're an anaesthetist. Um, adjuncts, I think, are very important. Um, trying to get it right, so tension-free closure, for example. And when you're trying to do that sort of surgery at midnight or two in the morning, I don't think that bodes well for a good, successful outcome. Your decision about um, whether meningitis exists um, depends on your definition of meningitis. And I think meningeal irritation and dural irritation exists more often. And if you ask patients for subtle symptoms, they will present those symptoms to you. If we're talking about infective complications, then in my practice that's rarer, but it does happen. Okay? And it mandates admission to hospital, intravenous antibiotic therapy, Treat that, settle that down, um, and then make a decision about uh, the timing of your surgery. Okay. Is there a distinction between a, an iatrogenic repair, repair of an iatrogenic leak, timing-wise, versus a spontaneous idiopathic leak? Yeah, yeah, I think there is. There is a difference in timing. So uh, your post-traumatic leak, so nasal injury, for example, nasoethmoidal fracture, I would always allow those to settle, um, if at all possible. So. Um, uh, whether you contemplate using something like a lumbar drain, I haven't had to do that, take the pressure off, um, but allow that leak to settle spontaneously. Um, so nothing, certainly within about 10 days, even longer sometimes. So maybe leave it for six weeks if, if the patient um, isn't uh, developing any adverse symptoms or signs. If there's any suggestion that this is becoming a complicated situation, I would always revise that decision. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other thoughts from our panelists? Uh, well, Brent, uh, the case you presented actually is somewhat extreme. Mm. It's very unusual. Uh, uh, we've done hundreds of cases of uh, CSF leaks, but majority of those cases were uh, not urgent. So, rhinary persisted uh, for some months or even some years, and the patient, some patient had already meningitis in mm. uh, their anamnesis. Uh, a different case. Uh, I, I had two or three cases like this. Uh, when uh, CSF leak uh, started several days after surgery for, for instance, uneventful surgery for inverted papilloma or some tumor, 
and the patient develops uh, meningitis. So in this case, as far as I know, it's quite dangerous to close the leak, so you have to treat meningitis first, and then, of course, when, when, when you treat meningitis, you can close the leak later, or it might stop spontaneously. Mm -hmm. I treat uh, the iatrogenic CSF leaks and the traumatic immediately. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important also for medical legal reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the encephalocells, I plan it the next day or the first, let's say, two weeks. And uh, my experience is as long as we have a strong CSF rhinorrhea, there is a less risk for meningitis. So if, you have, if the, the CSF leak stops, and there is no rhinorrhea, then I found and I have seen that there is a higher risk uh, to have a meningitis. When, sorry, when the, when the CSF leak stops, stops, then the risk is higher. Of when, meningitis. It, when it slows down? Then it slows down. Mm -hmm. If you have a strong yeah. CSF rhinorrhea, in my experience, because there is a drainage, you know, and uh, then there is a less risk for a meningitis. This is my experience from the I'm cases. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch. Uh, take, take the micro, uh, Andre. Uh, what about post-traumatic? What do you mean? Iatrogenic or uh, head trauma? If, if you have a head uh, a trauma and uh, you have an open uh, wound, then there is a high risk, okay, if you have a CSF rhinorrhea. But in spontaneous rhinorrhea, CSF leaks, for example, if you have a strong CSF uh, uh, rhinorrhea, then there is, in my experience, a less a meningitis risk than if it stopped. Mm -hmm. If it stopped, that means there is no drainage of the CSF. Yeah, I would concur with that. I tend to, I tend to feel that way myself, that a, a, a stronger leak or a bigger leak is actually probably a better thing for our patients in terms of risk. And I have to say, in this case, I, partic I was thinking, even though it's an iatrogenic leak and it's clearly the situation, my sense was because it had been going on for so long, and it was fairly profound, it was fairly brisk even in the clinic setting when she came to me that I thought she was safe to, to, to wait the couple weeks that she did wait, ultimately. I want to say that uh, even if you presented, a, let's say, a sad case, uh, this case brings a little joy to my heart because I thought previously that uh, only in Romania the, ra the radiologists have this kind of problem in interpreting. Well, uh, I think the radiologist was trained in Romania. Uh, yeah. enough. <laughs> must be, must be. I'm sorry. But, but the, other, the other problem is, uh, is what happened with the ENT uh, surgeon yes. that did this kind of surgery and did, 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 didn't saw that uh, it is a big hole there it's it's something yeah. and, and to do and another one another uh, surgery after the first one I think it's uh, something very a little bizarre. bit uh, bizarre yes very bizarre I, 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 I have a sense that perhaps they were just pretending that there was nothing there so that they could but it's it's a dangerous thing and I'll tell you honestly one point if one takeaway point if there's any ever any issue at all don't ignore these things you have to, I mean, there are quality people around you if you don't feel competent in taking care of it. There are quality people near you who can. And uh, that's when disasters happen, when you pretend like nothing is, is going on. So I think that in general, uh, I, se I definitely separate spontaneous from the traumatic iatrogenic group. And I think that all of us wait on the spontaneous because they've been, most of the time, been flowing for a long time. And as everyone's mentioned, that high flow you know, that high pressure differential, it's like water running down a river. You know, the flowing river is the one that has the least bacteria in it. The traumatic and the iatrogenic I struggle with a little bit more. I, I know that theoretically that they are similar. They're mechanical, right? There's a mechanical force that has resulted, whether that be a microdebrider or a car accident. There's a mechanical force. But I, I find that when, um, when it is iatrogenic from sinus surgery, there's almost always a clear penetration into that versus when you get trauma, you can have a skull-based fracture and then maybe the durus fracture, but it tends to be linear. It's not a hole. And I, I do agree that waiting and letting some of those settle probably saves some people from some surgery. I, I think that that's true. And many times those people are polytrauma and they're not suitable for the operating room irregardless. But um, we actually looked into this, like, um, you know, where individuals who had 
a uh, basically a CSF leak or meningoencephalocele in this particular case um, from FES. And when the repair is delayed more than three, three days, actually uh, the incidence of neurologic sequelae went up, at least in our retrospective review. And I think all of us would agree that if one of our colleagues or if we were to get a CSF leak in the operating room, we would repair it immediately. Like none of us would not repair that immediately. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm saying that in this particular case with 18 months of time, I would have rushed her off to the next day. But I think as a general principle, you know, when we have a post fest injury, you may not be in the condition to repair it at that moment. And I think that's understandable. And you may want to call your colleagues, and that's why you have them, to uh, go in there and repair that. I I've had many good surgeons say, hey, I, got, I did this revision fest, and I got a little leak in the posterior ethmoid. But I think the key is to recognize it, as you're saying, Brent, and then deal with it. Because the dealing with this is actually fairly straightforward. These, these are not complicated leaks to repair. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I involve the audience now? You receive this patient, and she comes to you. You see that there is a herniation. What would you do? Not from a surgical point of view. What would you do? Would, who would prescribe an antibiotic just in case to prevent uh, meningitis? Who would do that? Could you raise your hands? So some of you who would not prescribe an antibiotic? Most of you, that is, you are on the right side. Prescribing an antibiotic as what usually GPs do in order to prevent meningitis. And the problem is that you kill normal bacteria in the nose and then those who are usually saprophytes start to grow. And then you have a higher incidence of meningitis. And the, the ratio is 3% of risk of meningitis without antibiotic prophylaxis versus 8% of meningitis with antibiotic prophylaxis. Make, have, make it do difference. Well, wait, only micros, please. It is very tempting, of course, to, to think you should put these patients on antibiotic, but your point is so important that uh, we need to avoid that uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to reduce that risk. But would you give Pneumovax vaccine? Pneumovax, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that there's been any good study looking at that issue. It is very, uh, uh, I have done that for some, particularly my spontaneous leaks uh, uh, with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but I don't routinely do it, and I probably wouldn't have made a difference in this situation because this is a situation where the vaccine wouldn't have had any impact that quickly. But it is tempting, I agree. I don't know any other literature, though. Does, any, does uh, the panelist, uh, any comments on Pneumovax uh, vaccination for these patients? Yeah, I think we all do it, particularly when we are not sure whether there are occult, occult right. uh, CSF leaks going on. The thing is that you need to check your antibodies because not all patients Respond. react positively yeah. to your vaccination, so they don't have antibodies, and that may happen. Uh, Brent, thank you very much yeah. for your case. Uh, if we have time later, yeah. we come back to you. May I now ask um, Andre to present uh, his case? You will need to scroll through these slides until you reach your first case. Just push forward. No, he's doing that. Ah, he's doing that from behind the screen. Yeah, we have uh, someone working there for us. No, uh, you need to go back to uh, to my presentation, Bernard Spreckelson, and then forward or back? Forward. No, no, it's not you. It's he is doing right. that behind the screen, isn't he? Because. But I think this is you, your presentation with three cases. So it's out of our uploaded system. Yeah, yeah. Can you please go back to the uh, uh, presentation of Bernal's prep? Here we are. Thank Smart. you. Excellent. Andre. Yeah. Uh, so it was an unusual case. 44-year-old uh, uh, lady uh, with uh, Marfan syndrome. Uh, she had typical presentation of uh, this syndrome, uh, severe myopia, lens subluxation, uh, 
uh, father and brother died of uh, aneurysm rupture. It's also typical. Uh, and uh, she developed a uh, profuse uh, CSF leak uh, on the left side since three months. I just uh, want to shortly remind you uh, what is Marfan syndrome. This is hereditary uh, disease uh, of the connective tissue with the gene uh, defect, uh, gene responsible for collagen uh, synthesis. Uh, uh, well, I was surprised that uh, the disease is not that rare, uh, one uh, to 10,000 in population, and typical clinical uh, presentations apart from uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, uh, abnormal joints, flexibility, lens dislocation. Um, mm, uh, spinal cysts, uh, degenerative disc disease, and uh, lumbar dural sac ectasia that are not always visible at the early stage. And surprisingly, uh, we did not find uh, a single um, report on uh, encephalocele formation in this disease. Uh, so, uh, well, on, on the surgery, uh, in the sphenoid sinus, uh, several multiple small, uh, men, uh, I'm sorry, it's a mistake, meningocellus uh, presented and uh, we uh, found a large bone defect, uh, 25 uh, to 15 uh, milli millimeters. We use uh, multiple layer closure with the fascia letter, septal cartilage and nasal septum uh, periosteal flap, and uh, a month later, uh, the lady uh, developed a slow CSF discharge from, again, from the left nostril, uh, just two drops in a minute, uh, left sphenoid sinus, of course, was uh, almost completely opacified uh, after the surgery and the nasal septal flap. Uh, CT cisternography that we performed were suspicious of uh, defect in the left part of the cribriform plate. Uh, but uh, results of uh, cisternography were not conclusive. So uh, my question to the panel is, uh, does the patient need uh, surgical, immediate surgical revision or what is the timing of this surgical revision? Which kind of technique uh, would you go for complete anterior skull exposure, exposure because uh, the site of the leak um, uh, is not clear? Uh, or probably uh, we can use uh, conservative treatment with uh, acetazolamide, for instance, or we can use lumbar drain or lumbar peri peritoneal shunting. Uh, so what would be your opinion? You've got the micro still over there? Yeah. I do. I do. Um, Does not need to be in order, I mean. No, of course. Um, so has it been confirmed as beta-2 positive, or beta-trace protein positive? You know it's CSF? Let's say it was positive. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I only have ever had one Marfan's patient, and all I did was take out a small adenoma, and they healed actually just fine. I, I don't know that they necessarily have healing defects, at least to my knowledge. Um, and you know, thinking about things like shunting or acetazolamide suggests that the intracranial pressure is the driving problem. Um, and she, she's relatively not too obese. I think her BMI she's is She's not obese, yeah. and uh, yes, and uh, yeah. so, pressure you know, was normal. I, I'm sure her, her soft tissues, um, you know, because of the lack of strong collagen, um, does provide some um, in integral weakness. And I guess that, that would be my concern is that if, it's, if we think it's from the nasal septal flap harvest, probably done in a very normal and routine manner, just because of the relative weakness of the co patient's collagen, that could be the source. Um, and it may, it may require revision. What do you think, Brad? A revision of what? Well, it sounds like, well, I, so I, I suspect that the sphenoid looks like it's completely obliterated. I mean, it seems unlikely that even a 2.5 centimeter defect is 
you know, not closed or covered. It, it seems like it should be covered as long as she's had routine healing and, you know, she doesn't have a mucosal or something behind it. It's only been a month. So I, I suspect that that cistronogram is somewhat more accurate and it may be, um, you know, it may have unle uncovered uh, a small, you know, dissection down the cribiform. We know that there are natural holes there. And uh, it may have uncovered it with the uh, elevation of the nasal septal flap. So I think that's where I would look. Um, you know, we don't have fluorescein in the United States to use fluorescein, Brent. Oh, but you, you do, of course you do. Well, but we don't have it. off label. We don't have it. We, yes, we, we have it, depending on your legal climate. I don't have it, but you can use it off-label. And this actually might be a situation where that would be highly beneficial if you were going to re-explore. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, I think fluorescein would be a great option here. I do really rely on it in these situations to see if I can uh, identify a, a new source or if it's coming from the, uh, the old sphenoid defect there. I think that... Um, you know, I've even done fluorescein in the clinic, actually. We'll have my, my neurosurgeon will come by and just do a lumbar puncture and inject it. And we'll let the patient go eat lunch and come back and, and, stick, and put an endoscope in their nose. And I found that to be beneficial. My experience with these types of leaks, though, I mean, these are challenging leaks. And I'm not convinced that this is related to the Marfans. I think this is just a bad sphenoid leak, you know, one of those difficult uh, sphenoid leaks personally. And my experience is when I've had failures on those leaks is that it's the anterior most component because that's the most difficult aspect of, to see, that area at the anterior most aspect of the roof there. And I suspect that that's probably what ha happened. Uh, but again, I would rely on fluorescein. I would go back and explore it. I wouldn't do uh, conservative treatment as a starting point, though I may put the patient on acetazolamide after the second operation. I tend to do that uh, not as a starting point, but as a secondary type intervention. And I, I might use a lumbar drain during the, uh, in a revision case. I wouldn't do it in a primary, um, and I would not shunt. For me also, it is very difficult to close a, a leak that you cannot see. So first of all, we have uh, to, to see exactly the source of the leak. So in this case, uh, fluorescein uh, may be the, the best solution. And uh, of course, after the diagnosis, you can discuss what kind of, of, uh, of surgical technique you can propose for the patient. But first of all, to, to see exactly the, the, the source. I also agree. In order to find the, the localization of the CSF leak, I would also perform a fluorescein uh, endoscopy. But I would like to emphasize that we have uh, so also many patients that are not fat, that are not female, and that are not obese, and uh, they had also high endocranial pressure. Therefore, we routinely uh, uh, look about clinical signs for high endocranial pressure. That means. Also, our ophthalmologist will evaluate the patient, control the pupils, and then we will see if there is an enlargement of the cisterns, that means radio radiological findings. And uh, uh, I think the procedure that we will use depends on the localization of the defect. If the problem is in the sphenoid sinus, and it's not in the ethmoidal roof, and uh, my experience is it's not easy to differentiate if the problem is, very often, if the problem is in the sphenoid sinus or in the sphenoethmoidal recess, very often it's not easy. Therefore, fluorescein probe will be the first what I will done during a surgical procedure. Right. The nice thing about going last is I get to summarize. So um, making the defect larger, so exposure, okay? So um, exposing uh, transpterygoid approach, wider sphenoidotomy, septal window, making sure that your bed on which you're grafting is well prepared, okay? So meticulous care um, about preparing the bed uh, that's going to receive the graft, um, often making a defect larger, unfortunately, if you're trying to... Um, get the best option for closure. And in terms of your adjuncts, I would say yes to all of the above. So acetazolamide, very safe drug uh, to use, can be used in the long term. Pressures, really important. Okay, so making sure that opening pressures have been measured, so through lumbar puncture, <coughs> um, and really giving thought to um, whether the patient needs to be shunted. So ev everything, with a difficult case like this, everything becomes an option. Good. 
So this is the we, uh, yes we we were lucky with this case uh, we use uh, fluorescein and fortunately we did not find any obvious uh, leak in the area of sphenoid sinus so our reconstruction was effective and uh, when we followed uh, anterior skull base we found three small uh, fistulas in the olfactory fossa and they were successfully closed with uh, using fascia can, can I say, can I? Maybe, maybe this is a reason to control the intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. Because if there is a high intracranial pressure and you have closed uh, uh, successfully the defect in the sphenoid sinus, then they will find another weak point. You know? right. yeah, yeah. Therefore, monitoring also, if you have a high intracranial pressure, monitoring of the pressure postoperatively is the most important thing. Yeah, the thing is that you cannot uh, do invasive measurements as long as you have leaks because the pressure comes down, yeah. Thanks very much, Andre. We will come back to your uh, last case in, in should we have more time. May I now ask Dr. Manea to uh, make his presentation? You're not related to the famous Romanian uh, writer, aren't you? Sorry? There is a famous Romanian writer called Manea. Uh, maybe, it's not me anyway. <laughs> no, 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 that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's not a relative of mine, so... <laughs> uh, Can we uh, have the presentation of Dr. Manea, please? From, out, from behind, don't I worry. You will do from behind. Or? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> it's a great honor for me to, to be here. Did he Presentation of Dr. Okay. Manea, please. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Here we are, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, I didn't, I didn't pre uh, prepare some difficult, let's say, cases in terms of uh, the surgical uh, reconstruction of the, the defect, of the skull base defect. Uh, but uh, for me, anyway, uh, the most, uh, let's say, recurrent uh, situation in case of CSF leaks are that one uh, in which uh, you do not have a correct diagnosis. So uh, <clears throat> let's say most of the CSF leaks in which we have uh, problems are that one that are not diagnosed. So this is uh, uh, such a case with a female patient, 16 years of age. I do not have a presenter. Okay. Do you have a pointer? No pointer here. At the table? Oh, okay. Thank you. Unless yeah. Brent yeah, took okay. two of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have it here. Okay, thank you. So it's a 16 years old uh, female yes, that uh, for Romanian several years uh, had uh, some clear rhinorrhea on the left uh, side nostril. Uh, <clears throat> no traumatic uh, uh, episodes, uh, uh, craniofacial uh, in uh, in his uh, experience, in her experience. So uh, nothing very particular. Uh, the ENT colleagues that uh, uh, treated her for this uh, rhinorrhea. Uh, thought uh, initially that uh, it is an allergic problem. So for this uh, one-sided uh, allergy, uh, they prescribed uh, uh, for, uh, I think, two years uh, um, uh, corticotherapy, uh, intranasal it's, drops. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. This yeah. is pretty frequent yeah, yeah. that you get patients treated by GPs for unilateral allergic rhinitis, yeah. which of course does not exist. Yeah, so, thanks. Course, Sorry for interruption. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, this was uh, what we thought also. Uh, what kind of allergy can be unilateral? Uh, so uh, the patient was treated, as I told you, for two years for this kind of allergy. No complaints, uh, no particular complaints besides this uh, uh, runny nose. Uh, but uh, one month uh, prior, uh, uh, prior to the admission in our department, uh, he developed a meningitis, a bacterial meningitis. And uh, due to this incident, uh, uh, they perform a CT scan on the patient. And you can see here that uh, besides the fact that the, the left uh, sphenoid sinus is completely obliterated, or almost completely obliterated, and with uh, let's say, uh, liquid uh, level uh, on this side, you cannot see a very, very important defect uh, at the level of the, the sphenoid uh, um, uh, walls. Uh, so, uh, 
if you are looking much more closely, you can see here in the area of the optocarotical recess that there is a small, small uh, lesion. Uh, actually, we measured it, uh, it's around the one millimeter defect. And this one millimeter defect produces uh, something like this. So a small CSF leak in the optocarotical recess on the uh, left side of uh, this patient that didn't have too much complaints besides the, the, the meningitis that uh, uh, she performed uh, one month prior to the admission in our department. And I would like to ask now uh, uh, my colleagues what uh, would they do in this case? They will wait, they will do some, I don't know, conservative treatment, they will try to perform uh, some surgery. What kind of surgery in this, in this area? Raj, last, first time now. Yeah, good, okay, so I don't get to do the revision. Okay, so um, I would try not to overcomplicate the situation. I would intervene, I wouldn't okay. wait. This isn't a situation, I think, because she's had men meningitis. Yeah. Um, it's unilateral, so yeah. I would try to do a unilateral repair. And the optico carotid recess is a recess, and as you've shown there beautifully, it will receive a graft, hopefully, fairly easily. Okay? So the important points are how many layers am I going to use, what materials am I going to use, yeah. and also denuding that sinus of mucosa. Okay? So really important, denude the sinus of mucosa. If I'm concerned, I'll take out the intersinus septum and work on both sides. Okay? Graft material, I think about fat okay, in this particular situation, and I may swing a little flap up, so maybe an inferior turbinate flap or uh, a small hadad flap just to cover, cover the area as well. Okay, so drilling down the rostrum, taking down the floor of the sinus as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, I completely agree. Uh, I would perform, I think, uh, very limited, very delicate, uh, delicate surgery. Uh, probably I would not uh, go for underlay. I would also use uh, some fat to put it on lay. Uh, maybe press a little bit uh, in, into the cranial cavity and fix it uh, with, uh, with the fibrin glue. I think it would work in this particular case. Uh, that's for me a classical spontaneous CSF leak mm -hmm. in the carotid uh, optic recess. We know that in this area, in up to 25%, we have bony dehiscences. Uh, I will try to remove the mucosa around the defect, and then I will put a little bit of fat tissue inside very carefully, not to compress, the, for example, the optic nerve. Okay, this is very important. And to be honest, I will try only to cover it then with a free mucoperiostal uh, uh, graft, and I put then Sargisel to, to press it a little bit in this mm -hmm. area. I have done it in a lot of cases, and it works. So my, the, the Hadad flap, the nasoceptal flap, and uh, the flaps will be a second uh, uh, op Do you consider that the fibrous tissue that develops after the, the yes. surgery? Yes, is the, because it's the very. One that closed the, if the there is no intracranial pressure, there is a very, very small leak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I agree with Jonas. I think I would probably just put a free mucosal graft rather than a vascularized reconstruction. It's a, it's a small defect, probably quite low flow, you know, by all characteristics. I mean, the advantage of the recess, even though you, the dissection and the removal of the mucosa is maybe a little bit more difficult because of the carotid and the uh, optic nerve, it takes everything very well. It means it's very easy to sit it in their support. It's not going to be falling into anything. I, I think that's probably all I would do. I think it has pretty limited morbidity. It's essentially an extended sphenoidotomy, and then you're done. <clears throat> I, I like uh, removing the mucosa and putting fat in this. This, to me, is a perfect place to lay fat. I don't typically use fat for my repairs, but I think in a, cl in a case like this, it would be absolutely perfect, and then I would lay a graft over it. It would obliterate that entire cavity. Yeah. I have used free mucosal graft, which is why I said a pedicled flap, um, because the patient then went on to develop a pseudo meningocele. Okay, so uh, just a word of caution is that uh, you want to be sure about the quality of your repair. 
and this was delayed. So. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all agree that this is a CSF leak at the optic carotid recess? Look at the picture. I have not that impression. This is from me, the cella, intersphenoidal. This would be the paracella carotid. We are below, and this is for me, the uh, median. Or V2, whatever. I don't see the exact extension, could be V2. We have to trust our. <laughs> we have to trust. No, it's just, just asking, because it would make a difference, as I just learned from you, whether we are close to the optic nerve and which material we're going to use for reconstruction, or whether we are far away from the optic, where we could use fascia and just pluck that and make sure there is no herniation on the long term. Could you highlight that a little bit? But because yeah, yeah, the picture yeah, is definitely. incomplete for me. But this is, yeah. uh, so this is a bony... Um, um, attachment on the carotid uh, wall here, and uh, this might, I think, in my opinion anyway, this is uh, the, the optic uh, uh, bulge. Uh, this is the movie. Uh, it should start if someone press on the movie. Can we, can we start the movie uh, at this? Uh... So this is the, 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 the bony partition that is attached that you saw in that, uh, in that picture uh, on, the, on the optic here on the carotid artery. So after we remove the, 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 the mucosa in that area, we put some uh, a flap and then uh, the uh, fibrin glue. And uh, as uh, also uh, the panelist told, uh, we put some, uh, some uh, uh, abdominal fat and uh, everything worked uh, quite okay for this patient. We, I think we have uh, three or four years of uh, follow-up uh, until now and uh, no more recurrence and no more uh, meningitis because yeah. this was, I think, the reason that uh, we, uh, for us for, to, to, to do the surgery. Can I ask the panelists, would, would that have been a larger defect with even herniation? So would you go for an obliteration of the sphenoid sinus? Is that an option? Uh, Forget the case, just no, larger no, no. Yeah. defect, herniation, would you go for obliteration of the sphenoid sinus? And if so, with what? Yeah, probably uh, <laughs> this could be discussed, discussed with my uh, second case. Uh, we, well, in the beginning when we started uh, surgical treatment of CSF leaks, especially in the leaks in the hyperextended lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus, uh, when we not technically uh, was unable to uh, securely close the defect, we used obliteration. So we obliterated uh, either uh, lateral part of uh, the sphenoid uh, or entire sphenoid but uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, technically very difficult as well to depitalize this lateral recess. Uh, if, you, if you can do it, you can actually, you can close the effect as well. If you don't do it uh, in uh, the early, our early experience, we had, uh, I think, 50% of recurrence in these cases of obliteration. So uh. I don't do it anymore. And have you uh, seen then uh, mucoceles and the sphenoid sinus? No, no, no. no. There, there's a paper from neurosurgeon telling that obliteration of the sphenoid can produce uh, mucoceles and the sphenoid sinus on the long term. So any any different comment from what Andre mentioned? Yeah. It's not easy if you have a, a large sphenoid sinus to remove the mucosa completely. Practically, it's not easy because there are many recesses. So what I, I, I do in traumatology, if I have many fractures and many CSF leaks, I try to remove the mucosa completely and then I use a, a fascia lata, I put the fascia lata inside like a tobacco pouch and then I fill my fascia lata with fat. I don't remove the, the, the uh, sphenoid sinus. I do not obliterate the sphenoid mm -hmm. sinus completely. I think the issue of trauma is actually even more challenging. When, when it's an isolated single one, as you were talking about, well, I, I tend not to obliterate just like these guys. I, I tend to try to just define the skull-based defect. Because then, 
um, I mean, maybe it's, I want to preserve the sinus, maybe that's part of the problem, or the good or the bad, but typically, especially if it's spontaneous, the bony defect is not very large. Typically, the bony defect is quite a bit smaller than the meningoencephalocele. So once you've either resected or reduced it, and you actually see the bony defect, you don't actually need as much to reconstruct that. And again, as we, as we mentioned earlier, I think the key is controlling that pressure postoperatively. Like I, I routinely actually, uh, two or three weeks after they equilibrate, have my uh, interventional radiologist puncture the patient with an opening pressure. Because at that point, the patient is re-equilibrated. Like they're truly at whatever their pressure is. If they have papilledema, that's actually even easier because then the neuro-ophthalmologist can follow them. But there are some who have increased pressure who have no papilledema. And then, unfortunately, you're stuck with some you know, invasive interventions to determine. Right. I'm going to be a little contrarian in terms of the reconstruction because I think that uh, you can probably use anything to reconstruct. It doesn't have to be a pedicle graft or anything. I really believe that the key to repair of these things is exposure of the defect, complete exposure, and complete preparation of the area. It, it's when you don't prepare it real well, you don't see it real well, and you leave little bits of mucosa behind and things like that, that's when I feel like I have failure. Um, so I can, I can throw up a kitchen sink up there, and I think it's going to work ultimately. Thanks, Brian. Questions from the floor? Raise your hands. Participate. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Guys, come on. I know it's in the afternoon, but... Yeah, they have a leak, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so. He's saying so, I don't. No questions so far, okay. That means that everything has been clear so far. So thank you very much, Dr. Mania, uh, Claudio. Can I ask Eric now to come upstairs? And uh, can we have the presentation of Dr. Eric Wang? So I'm going to switch this up a tiny bit. Um, so... Uh, I'm part of the UPMC Center for Cranial-Based Surgery, and one of the things we do with some regularity are clivocordomas. Um, and so actually, I find these to be one of the most frustrating uh, repairs, <laughs> reconstructions. I don't know what my panelists feel about this. Um, in our hands, uh, we always seem to have this trade-off between greater and greater resections and increase the um, So. Um, here, here's a kind of very prototypical case. It's actually a fairly straightforward uh, chordoma um, with uh, posterior extension intradural, as you can see. Um, and uh, they had a biopsy done on the outside, of course. And I'm not going to bore you with the surgical resection. That's not the point of this panel. But you can see this is a complete transclival defect. The pituitary is completely exposed here. Actually, the entirety of the posterior clinoids and the tuberculum, I mean, the posterior clinoids have been removed. Um, the petrous apex has been removed. This goes almost essentially down to the nasal pharyngeal fascia. And you have the basilar complex. So you're really in the pre-pontine cistern. This is a very high flow CSF leak area. And um, there are no ledges. This is straight to nasal pharynx. This is, this is what we have. And um, I'm curious um, if the panelists have an algorithm for this particular, you know, this is um, essentially a six centimeter defect, like in this dimension, and about four in this. So it's a large, it's a large defect. And uh, curious if, or anyone in the room, actually, even not just the panel. Who would send that to Pittsburgh? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you guys have a reconstructive algorithm that you like to use in this? Friend, system? you've got the so, mic. So I, I, I absolutely agree. These are the most horrendous leaks from my standpoint to repair. I hate them uh, because they, you know, everything is working against you in these situations. You've got gravity working against you that wants to pull it down from superiorly. You've got high flow. It's a big defect. It's everything bad that we deal with. These are definitely challenges in my uh, institution as well. Um, I go multi-layer. I will use fat in these situations. I'll use a free graft because we don't have a nasal septal flap oftentimes in these cases. If I have a septal flap, I'll do it. I'll do a pedicle graft. But oftentimes, tumor is involving the, the sphenoid, and we can't, we can't access a, a graft uh, that way. So I'll use a free graft and uh, uh, frequently with tissue glue. And I basically do everything in these situations, as I'm sure all of us do. We say that this is the most heavy reconstruction, the most difficult, mm -hmm. because we know that in this area there are the cisterns, this is a high flow uh, 
as a first layer, we would like to use fat as a first layer and then three layers of fascia lata. Okay. If an, a nasoceptal flap is, is possible, yeah. of course, this will be our sure. first option. But uh, the, this, are, this area is uh, associated with the highest uh, rate of failure after radiotherapy, you know. Yeah, absolutely. This is really a difficult case. Yeah. Yeah. If, well, you, if you are a neighbor, I will send you the case, of course. <laughs> Right. Right. Well, I, uh, actually, I don't have much experience with endonasal carnosal uh, surgery, but uh, I would say that uh, majority of my cases uh, and uh, cases like uh, this, I, I mean, uh, skull-based tumors, we, we do in the National Institute of Neurosurgery. So we have a very close cooperation. <laughs> I would say they have a very close cooperation with us. <laughs> so we help them uh, always. And uh, anyway, they are ready always to help us. So probably I would uh, try to do as much as I could in this situation. But then I would ask neurosurgeon, maybe they can do it with... Uh, transcranial approach. Hmm. Yeah. This, is, this is a great defect, Eric. It's a so multi-layer closure. Again, I'll echo uh, what the panel have said. We're using fascia lata, okay, uh, which is a nice thick material. Tutoplast, cadaveric fascia lata, is something that I'm using quite a lot in the skull base now. Um, so it avoids donor site morbidity for mm -hmm. up to 12 months after surgery. Um, important in females as well that you don't give them a scar um, if they wear bikinis and uh, that sort of thing. Um, I'm sorry to take it off piece and uh, start have that conversation. It's because right? Raj is bikini, <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Okay, but anyway. And then <clears throat> gravity, as we've already said, is working against us, okay? So trying to, as you start to do your resection, is having some thought in your mind about how you're going to make this thing stick, right? So uh, a nasopharyngeal pouch, okay? Mm -hmm. So at the lower end is not denuding or debriding all of that musculature and mucosa yeah. and leaving it as some sort of pouch to receive your graft, right? And that's mm -hmm. number one. Number two is that size of defect, a vascularized flap would be excellent. So a pedicled nasoceptal flap that you take along the floor of the nose. Roger, do you if, mind if I start showing while you talk? No, I do, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing is your pericranial flap, okay, which mm -hmm. is a brilliant piece of tissue you can take as a strip between your temporalis muscle fascia. I do it through a bicoronal incision and then tunnel through the glabella. Absolutely. And you can pretty much get that to your tonsils if you need to. So that's a really big, healthy piece of tissue to put in through, through, through the nose if you're struggling. Absolutely. The pericranial flap is actually a very uh, valuable adjunct. So here is an extended nasal septal flap. I, I think actually the extension to the floor is really very beneficial in clival reconstruction because it's the width. You end up dragging it across. Um, the reconstruction, so the width helps. You do have to be meticulous. So this one, you know, the other side, the pedicle was ablated from the outside biopsy. So I'm stuck uh, leaving this around this gigantic spur. But we all manage these things. And uh, you want to have, of course, a robust pedicle and all the kind of typicals for nasal septal flap reconstruction. But again, as everyone has mentioned, um, it's because these are challenging leaks, one layer never does it. You know, we need multiple layers. Um, and in our institution, uh, unfortunately, we found in these transclival defects, um, we actually need quite a bit of support because there is a risk of pontine herniation, where the pons actually becomes an encephalocele into the defect. Thankfully, no one has been, um, no one has been actually problematic, but here, so we put in the fascia lata. We use a collagen matrix as our arachnoid reconstruction. And it's this fat layer between the periclival carotids that actually prevents that pontine uh, encephalocele. And then here's the nasal septal flap, which can then be, um, again, sort of placed over the entirety of the repair. And that fat helps buttress it up so that actually the flap can sit across the entirety of the repair rather than kind of going into the clival recess and defect it itself here. This is a research study we're doing, um, actually STORE supports it, where we're using IC Green, which is a, obviously a very uh, well-studied uh, intervention for vascularization, and you can prove to yourself that you have good vascularization of your reconstruction, um, which uh, thankfully in this particular case we have uh, quite robust uh, vascular reconstruction. And uh, in a second, um, the post-op MRI, which is still sort of the gold standard for your nasal septal flap, um, shows that there's good enhancement. So I think these kinds of things reassure you, but despite you know, um, 
despite these kinds of interventions, our, our series says that, that we still have 23% CSF leak, which sounds horrendous in our modern age, but actually when you compare it to whether it's far lateral, terional, our neurosurgeons also are in the 20 to 30% leak rate you know, through transcranial approaches, so it's not a panacea uh, for this particular disease process. Here's another patient with a very similar situation, uh, gross total resection, cranial nerve 6 palsy, et cetera. Um, I will, well, this is the defect, just so you can see it quickly. Um, again, this uh, same uh, sort of reconstruction, but what I'll point out to you in this particular situation is that the flap is a little bit less exciting. Uh, the flap is a little bit uh, paler and duskier, and, um, well, I won't bemoan the panelist time on this, uh, but basically it's a very similar reconstruction, okay? Uh, with again, the clival fat, and then the nasal septal flap is less robust in this particular uh, setting. Actually, as it comes into view here, hopefully in a second, you actually see, we had to tuck it in the maxillary sinus because we had to go so low. You see, it's a little bit more pale than the typical, um, which is always concerning. Uh, and sometimes when you kink it on itself, basically turn it on itself at 180 degrees, sometimes it doesn't look overly robust in this early setting. and so. Um, this patient presented on post-op day number eight with positional headaches only. Because especially with these really, really low clival defects, they don't always have the rhinorrhea that's dropping out of the nose. You can see it actually goes straight down to the throat. You know? And sometimes it's hard for them to tell them about salty taste because you know, we, we put so many precautions with them in skull -based, endoscopic skull-based surgery. So we got the CT cisternogram, and unfortunately you see the CSF egress, uh, just as Raj was commenting, you know, on the real inferior aspect where the nasopharyngeal fascia uh, approximates the nasal septal flap. Um, all right, guys, what do you do in this setting? Drain them, take them back. I, I, I try a drain first. So, um, you know, see if you can try and settle this down with a drain for three days, four days. You don't want to leave a drain in too long. Okay, mm -hmm. because there are drain-related complications. For sure. um, but I would use that as a first-line option. Uh, equally, in my thought process, would be taking the patient back to theatre fairly soon to plug whatever little defect there is. And you can very easily uh, identify where it's coming from, uh, use a little periumbilical fat, uh, a bit of tissue, fibrin glue, that sort of thing, and just settle it down quickly. Well, this is actually what we do. We, we do whatever possible. Drain, of course, uh, if necessary, uh, shunting. And uh, uh, we would take this patient for revision, of course, because the remaining defect might be quite small and uh, right. can be easily closed. Thank you. I think this is a good indication for Lambert drain, of course. And... Uh, it depends how, how big the defect is. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will wait and see what happened with the lumbar drain. Can, can I interrupt? Because you talk about lumbar drain. Would this patient have a lumbar drain from the very beginning? Yeah, they would. So um, I, I'm sorry, it's taken us forever to, to actually publish our randomized control trial. But we actually did a randomized control trial on intradural um, defects. So they had to be greater than one by one centimeters into a true arachnoid cistern or preventricular space. And we found that in these posterior fossa defects, lumbar drain dramatically reduces the incidence of CSF leak. Um, in our series, it went from that 23%, it goes down to about five to seven. So this patient actually, thank you, Manuel, this patient was actually perioperatively drained. Um, which is another you know, adjunct that we tend to use in this situation, and yet despite this, we still have this struggle. Yeah, so, but, but did all these did, things are did true. you monitoring them after Lambert III? You know, so we, we struggle with that. Our nursing staff is not as good at the, as the pen people. Apparently, you know, in Philadelphia, which is just across the state from us, they monitor all the time and have no problems, but we actually find it to be quite hard to do. Um, okay. But we drain for three days. We drain pretty aggressively. We drain 10 milliliters per hour. So it's a pretty aggressive drainage. Um, Pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if the lumbar drainage was not a solution, uh, uh, then means that uh, uh, yeah. entering once again in the theater, I think, is the is the option in, in order to try to, to close. What kind of leak uh, yeah. do you do you see? Brent, do you mind if I show? Go ahead. So I'll just show you sort of the novel way that we have been trying to deal with this. We're, we, we've been exploring intranasal suturing, and the Japanese are actually really good at this. I mean. They spend a couple hours throwing in 11 interrupted sutures. 
Um, this is how we do it. it. This is difficult. You know, the needle drivers are not very ideal for endonasal suturing. You don't have the, the torsional turn in the depths. So you can see this is quite painful, actually, uh, to sew this together. But the leak, as you expected, really is right here at the nasal pharyngeal fascia and uh, the fascia lata or the nasal septal flap. And um, so, you know, this is what we, we did for a while. It's, it's really quite difficult. So I actually borrowed this from our, um, our robot guys. So, you know, more and more uh, oral pharyngeal cancer is dealt with robotically, and they use this thing called a VLOC suture. Uh, which is a knotless suture, which is actually one of the biggest challenges. You can actually throw the needle, but throwing the knot, it's hard. So here you pass it through this eyelet, and then you can push it down. Now, don't get me wrong, this took me forever, okay? I mean, this is not fast, but, but ir irregardless, you can push it down and get it to lock down, okay? And then, and then you basically run the suture, like a baseball, like a running suture along the, along the defect. And I think in this particular setting, Suture approximation actually makes some sense because we're really dealing with soft tissue. There's not carotids here. There's not cranial nerve six here. This is nasopharynx fascia. You know, it's not critically important for their livelihood. So, so sewing this together actually um, works kind of well. And um, we don't do it for every case, but it, it, it's, I think it's a nice adjunct and it can help you in these tougher cases when sometimes you just can't get good approximation because there's no shelf. What we would have done before is like when many of my colleagues said, we would have tried to pack fat into the area, try to get it to seal in that way. But as you can see, it actually provides a pretty robust seal to help the tissues sort of heal against that high flow pressure. And so I, I don't have any stock in Covidian, it's from Ireland. But basically this is what it does. It has these little barbs kind of like um, endobrow. You know, many people have done endobrow for facial plastics. And this is this borrowing, again, from our head and neck oncology colleagues as they do more and more robotic oropharyngectomies. And um, that's basically where I stole the idea. I watched them do it under a robot, and so we stole this idea. And um, this is getting published in Operative Neurosurgery. So uh, again, I think clival defects are an incredible challenge. I hope that that was an interesting idea that maybe Many you can Many thanks, Eric. Many thanks. Just, just an edit, a comment uh, while uh, Raj is uh, connecting, uh, I would take advantage of having the lumbar drainage and use uh, CSF leak through the lumbar drainage to identify the exact location of the, uh, of the defect. Brent? Yeah, that's, I was going to allude to that same point. The temptation is to pull down your whole repair. Oftentimes, in, especially in these cases, uh, it is just a tiny area that ends exactly. up uh, being the leaking yeah. area. And so just address that area. And it's almost always at that inferior margin. We, in we have also good experience by infiltrating uh, a flu seal in that area or uh, tissue glue. And that usually keeps things uh, going well. Uh, the man with the leak had a question? No, he hasn't. Raj, please. So if you could just switch my presentation, I've just connected it to the VGA. So following Eric is quite embarrassing, really, because he's stepped it up. I'll step it right down now, OK? Um, so I want to show you just a little technique, um, and then hopefully it stimulates Could we a switch bit of to discussion. the uh, laptop presentation, please? Stimulates a little bit of discussion, then, about uh, choice of uh, technique for closure. Okay, thank you. Thanks for doing that. That's great. Okay, so just a, a surgical technique. Um, we've been talking uh, about types of closure, um, and I want to present to you um, the little um, adjuncts that you can use to try to help you to close CSF leak. So this is the sort of situation, okay, patient with CSF rhinorrhea. Important thing, she's not particularly overweight. Um, she does or did smoke, so respiratory disease, COPD, predisposing her to um, CSF rhinorrhea, but essentially a spontaneous leak without um, any uh, evidence of raised intracranial pressure. 
So in terms of investigations, you've seen CT scans from my colleagues. So uh, the defect was shown uh, to be lateral lamella of cribriform plate, okay, so unilateral leak. Uh, smoker, okay, so adjuncts um, in terms of uh, uh, repair materials, for example. Uh, we've talked a little bit about fat. We've talked about fasciolata. Uh, we've talked about tissue, um, which are very, very uh, useful um, products to use when you're reconstructing skull-based defects. Um, obesity, I want to just throw that into the mix as well. So your patients who have severe obesity and bariatric treatments prior to their surgery. And of course, trying to optimize their respiratory uh, disease. Okay, So if you've got someone who's a chronic cough, cougher, raised intracranial pressure, is really trying to optimize so, you know, this is difficult CSF leaks, but what I'm actually doing is taking it back to basics, right? Okay, so addressing the basics to try to optimise your chance of success. So closure, closure options that we've heard about already, so autografts from the patient themselves, allografts, okay, so I mentioned a product called Tutoplast, which is a fascia lata, cadaveric material. There are different country rules, I, I accept that, okay, but it... Um, is a, a, a fantastic piece of tissue. And again, it, if you think that taking fascia lata from your patient doesn't involve morbidity, um, I think you really need to start uh, having those conversations with your patients again, perhaps 12 months after surgery. Okay, So climbing stairs, um, exercise, all of those sorts of things are affected. Um, xenograft. So again... Um, one of the products that I would consider using but haven't used yet is something called Tutopatch bovine pericardium. Okay, so that, again, that's another variation for your patients perhaps that don't want uh, cadaveric ma uh, material um, inserted. Lumbar drainage, we've already alluded to. Okay, I think it can be fantastically beneficial. Nasal packing, I seem to have gone sort of full circle in terms of nasal packing, so we did a lot then we did not a lot, and now I've gone back to doing a lot. So things like nasopore and Foley catheters and supporting. Okay, I, I, I tried using something called a rapid rhido. Okay, so uh, it has balloons in it, but we found that that wasn't giving enough tamponade to support um, reconstructions and skull-based repairs. So we've sort of gone full circle again over the past few years. In terms of localization, I find CT scans... Uh, helpful. They have to be high resolution, okay, so 0.625 millimeter slice thickness. MR cisternograms if the patient is leaking, but I don't really find MR scans particularly helpful for, for CSF leaks. And then we've mentioned fluorescein, which is again a fantastic um, way of trying to localize those difficult to find leaks. Pedicle flaps, so you've heard uh, some of us talk about the Haddad nasoceptal. Um, flap. So this is based on a specific artery that comes into the back of the nose. Um, the inferior turbinate flap and middle turbinate flaps are something I like using, again, based on specific arteries, so posterior lateral nasal arteries, which are branches of your sphenopalatine artery. So again, those can be a fantastic piece of tissue. The first thing we do, right, is we cut the turbinate off and throw it away, okay? Discard it. But what I'm trying to do is to be tissue preserving and using the material that I've got local to me to reconstruct skull-based defects. And then something called a sewell boyden flap, which is a random pattern flap. It was described in the 30s and then popularised in the 50s. But again, dipping into the literature, you find that some of these things have been described. So that's a flap that's based on the ascending process of the maxilla onto your nasal septum, so perpendicular plate, and you've got a great paddle of tissue then that you can use to reconstruct your skull-based defect. So what is it? What's the middle turbinate flap? And I'm sorry to, as Eric gave the complicated presentation, this is like the junior, junior level presentation, okay? So middle turbinate, left side, nasal septum is there, okay? This is lateral wall, so ascending process maxilla. Middle turbinate has been infiltrated with some local anaesthetic with adrenaline. And then what you're doing is making an incision on that leading edge of the turbinate, okay, that extends laterally, so lateral border of turbinate, and then medially, medial border of, of, of turbinate. And the idea behind the flap then is that you have a piece of tissue that is pedicled posteriorly on the posterior lateral nasal artery. 
So super piece of tissue to be able to use to reconstruct skull-based defects in the region of your lateral lamella, cribriform plate, roof of ethmoid, right the way from anterior ethmoid all the way back to posterior ethmoid. So what I've done here is reflect the mucoperiosteum laterally, reflect the mucoperiosteum medially, and then you've got the middle conca. That's your middle conca bone. So you need to start removing that middle conca bone. Okay? And the most important part of that bony resection is posteriorly, because unless you take that little flake of bone out posteriorly, you can't rotate your flap and you can't lay that flap on the skull base. Okay? So what you're, what you're then left with is, uh, uh, as I say, a piece of tissue that's pedicled posteriorly. Normally you just uh, discard the turbinate, you wouldn't use it for anything, but this then gives you a lovely piece of tissue that you can rotate up and glue to the skull base to repair that defect. Okay, so that's your middle turbinate flap. A variation of that, okay, so this is what I actually used in the lady that I showed you um, that uh, clip of video for. So this is middle turbinate, I'm, I apologise, I'm using an angled endoscope here, so I just went straight from um, identifying the site of the leak to, to, to taking the video. But what I've done here is use a micro debrider to denude the lateral surface mucoperiosteum, okay? And then use a curette and backbiters and ball probes to remove the middle conca, okay? And then you can divide your turbinate from its skull base attachment, okay, from its lateral attachment. And again, you have a half width piece of pedicle tissue to reconstruct your skull base defect, okay? So rather, again, than discarding the middle turbinate, you can just rotate that flap onto the skull base, okay? So uh, uh, base preparation is really important, so getting rid of all that muco, mucosa, mucoperiosteum, you have to have a bed that receives your flap and your graft, otherwise it just drops off, okay? So, questions to the panel. How do you make your decision on which closure technique to use? Okay. And how do you optimise your chance of success? For example, bariatric surgery, shunting, respiratory disease. We've covered a lot of this already, but uh, just your thoughts particularly about bariatric. So I'll, I'll take the uh, second question first. Uh, uh, I have some experience with bariatric surgery, and I, uh, it's incidental experience, ends of one and two. But uh, I have to say it's been impressive how it has benefited a couple of my patients. Uh, have one case of a spontaneous uh, lateral lamella encephalocele that I uh, reconstructed on a patient, uh, an, uh, uh, a middle-aged woman who was quite obese, clearly with evidence of, uh, of OSA as well, though not treated. Um, and uh, we repaired her. She did very well. but. As uh, I followed her in the subsequent months, I saw a new little meningocele start to form on the opposite side. It wasn't leaking. It was just there. And, and I said, you know, you need to lose weight. Any way you can, you need to lose weight. And you know what? She actually did. She didn't have bariatric surgery. She actually lost weight through a program. She was a nurse. She did it. She lost a lot of weight. She's been able to maintain it now for uh, literally years now after the fact. But the interesting thing was is that little meningocele retruded yeah, right. intracranial. And you can actually look at her endoscopy now currently and where it used to protrude down into the nose, now it's actually a little hole heading up. And you can tell that her intracranial pressures have diminished substantially. Yeah. So I'm a big believer that weight control of some sort or another, particularly in these patients with evidence of sleep apnea, is very, very important to ultimate success. Thanks. Somebody want to answer the first question so that we then can proceed with the presentation of uh, Yanis? Claudio? Yeah. Uh, the decision about uh, which Yanis. kind of uh, closure technique to use. <laughs> I think uh, there are, let's say, several parameters that we have to follow uh, in making the decision. First of all, the localization of, uh, of the, the leak, uh, then uh, the dim dimension of the leak, and uh, of course, what kind of materials uh, we have uh, at our disposal, and also um, the things about uh, what are our skills. Uh, let's say you have to do the type of surgic, surgery that you are able to do it uh, uh, um, best. Uh, 
uh, in order to to uh, manage in the best way your your patient. So, uh, in the, this situation, I want to uh, emphasize also that we are using uh, a lot of uh, uh, middle uh, turbinate uh, uh, flap in close uh, in order to close the defect on the the cribriform yeah, plate and also on the on the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate. Thanks, Claudio. Questions from the floor? Burning questions? We started five minutes later, so I assumed that we were able to go five minutes. I only would like to make a comment. Uh, I very much like this uh, uh, middle turbinate flap. What I do is I preserve the head of the middle turbinate in order to avoid an, an uh, obstruction of the frontal sinus ostium, especially if I perform and complete ethmoidectomy and uh, removal of agonazi, you know, because there is a high risk then to obstruct. So I try to preserve the, the head, the anterior part of this flap, let's say. Yeah, well, the, the other issue is that all these flaps coming from pedicle flaps or middle or inferior terminate, they keep their memory of the tissue. So it's sometimes not easy to open them. They have the tendency to, to, to come back to the original position. So you really need to uh, work on them. Thanks. I, I would like to present you a, a tumor case. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this was a 65 years old male, first presented, as you see, complaining of a before and redness of the right canthal region. I cannot change it here. Oh. Maybe here? Okay. You see the CT and MRI of this patient. So the, the medial rectus uh, was uh, uh, infiltrated. Uh, you see the orbit, the orbital fat was infiltrated, and you see also that the, the dura uh, was infiltrated and there was a, a little intracranial extension. Uh, you see also in the MRI that uh, the tumor was, uh, uh, on the, was completely obstruct the ethmoidal uh, cavity. What I done in this, what we done in this case, first we start with chemotherapy. There was not a good response in chemotherapy. And then we performed a uh, complete removal of the tumor with, uh, ex I accelerate the orbit because the medial rectus and the fat tissue was infiltrated. And I, uh, I have uh, reconstructed the, the, uh, the, uh, the skull base in three layers. I, I have done a nasoceptal flap, and everything was uh, fine. Everything was uh, fine. This is an MRI nine months later. And 15 months later, I had my first failure using a nasoceptal flap. I have done a lot of them. I have used it very often. So you see there was a focal meningitis. You see a pneumocephalus. You see the patient was, has a diabetes and he has also cardiovascular problems. I think we should never forget also the whole picture, the whole uh, condition of our patients. So my question to you is, what should you do in this case? How should you close this defect? I, I take biopsies from all around the area. There was no recurrence. I think the first that we have to think is if there is a local recurrence, but there was no recurrence. So, the difficult case, difficult case. I think the exenteration, very important. Um, I would personally be a little bit cautious about using the nasoceptal flap from the same side um, as my uh, tumor. So the tumor was on uh, the right side of the skull base. But if you have a situation now where there is a fistula um, is trying to localize where that fistula is. And if the patient's had radiotherapy, um, it's going to make your reconstruction option challenging. Okay. So in this sort of situation where I would be concerned about disrupting the bed and trying to do this endoscopically, I would liaise with my neurosurgical colleagues and we would probably do a, either uh, an osteoplastic flap type approach, so go through the back wall of the frontal sinus, or to do uh, a small craniotomy and lay down some pericranium across the floor uh, of the anterior skull base. 
Sergei? Uh, <clears throat> well, I would say that uh, we did see a lot of cases like this, uh, but uh, not uh, after endonasal surgeries. Because as I mentioned before, we work in a uh, neurosurgical institution and uh, they perform uh, huge, extended, very radical surgeries with the uh, result uh, like defect like this. And uh, so in this particular case, I think the algorithm should be uh, to start with uh, some uh, limited uh, endonasal uh, procedure. Uh, as you've shown, you have used already nasal septal flap, and I think you were able to close uh, the biggest part of the defect. So probably the secondary uh, defect is not that big, and uh, you can uh, you can try to use it uh, to close it endonasally. If it doesn't work, uh, of course, it's uh, work for neurosurgeons for some kinds of transcranial approach or so on. And of course, and it's, it's a very difficult case, and uh, you have to be ready that healing will be uh, very much prolonged and not effective. I want to ask you, uh, the radiotherapy was performed when after the surgery? Uh, after, after the surgery. After, uh, what 60 gray. No, no, the time, the time after the surgery, when? I think three and a half, four weeks after. Four weeks after the surgery. Yes. Uh, so it might be a problem of... But this, uh, is, this is the condition 40, months. 50 months later. Yeah, but so, sometimes, in, I don't know, in my opinion anyway, uh, the radiotherapy doesn't do, let's say, much harm at the beginning. Maybe at uh, months after the radiotherapy, exactly. Uh, uh, exactly. things may go worse, like uh, necrosion or, or something like this. Uh, in this situation, it's very difficult because the irradiated tissue, it's uh, very, let's say, uh, uh, with... Uh, low potential of, of, uh, of uh, healing, and uh, I think it's, yeah, quite a complex case. What, what does it look like endoscopically in that area when you look in there? You see the defect? Granulations in the middle. Yeah. This is the dura leak. And you see the granulations. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, uh, this, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be a problem, right? The radiation therapy, the diabetes, everything makes it worse. But you're doing exactly what I would be thinking about. <laughs> we were having a discussion about whether we need to come external and, uh, and get tissue and bring it down over that. I think that's your best source, and that's going to be your best chance of success. I might have tried with that defect initially to do something endoscopically, but understanding that it probably is going to ultimately need this. Eric? Yeah, I would do this. I mean, um, unfortunately, you know, with exonerations, the ipsilateral pedicle is bad, right? So you have to actually use a bicoronal. You can't even do a hemi. Even though the, the, the skull base defect is quite small, since the vascular pedicle to your pericranial flap is not beneficial for you, um, I think pericranial flap is a good thing. I, you know, for my exoneration defects, I tend actually to do a temporalis flap up front, actually to cover. Um, and so I probably would have done this fairly early, a temporalis transposition uh, into the defect. Um, it's really not very hard to do. It fills it quite well, right? And, and also, um, if you really want to, you know, and some people don't like the cavity aspect of it, then it's, it kind of obliterates the space a little bit more. So um, pericranial flap on the contralateral side is option one. This is TP fascia, I think, right? Um, you could do a temporalis muscle and obliterate the exoneration site. And then if all of those things were to fail, um, free tissue transfer is not particularly difficult in this situation either. Um, you know, uh, anterior lateral thigh hooking up to the superior temporals will, will work every time. Like, you'll, you'll fill the cavity. Lumbar train? I don't think you're going to need a lumbar drain. I think it's probably pretty low flow. I think uh, it's the unfortunate combination of um, some patient uh, some patient effects like the diabetes and whatnot, but it's probably the radiotherapy. The radiotherapy and the dry cavity from the orbital exant is just a bad combination for, for your tissue to heal, I think. Okay. Yeah. Can, can so, I ask you a question, Yanis? Uh, after the radiotherapy on the anterior skull base, uh, uh, which then 
keeps up being denuded. What is the risk of osteoradionecrosis of the bone in that area? It's, it's, uh, if, if there is no covering of the bone, there is a high risk, let's say. Mm. There is exactly a higher risk. But it's not only the CSF leak. Yes, of it's, course, it's of course. I have seen such a cases, and then we have to try them with antibiotics for a long, intravenously for a long time. And this is, this is a special issue. We have not to forget it. Especially I have seen also in the clival area, Eric, oh, yeah. many, many osteoradionecrosis. And then, or near to the internal carotid artery, and this is very difficult to manage. I, I sent them to hyperbaric uh, uh, oxygen therapy, uh, we treat them a long time with chinolones uh, intravenously, but uh, we have many cases that then we ha will have a complete skull base uh, osteoradionecrosis. And this is, it, is that a few patients die also from these yeah, complications. Sure. And, and considering that on that side we probably have uh, no longer olfaction, that is right, yes. would you also consider to do a reconstruction? just uh, below the brain from within? Yes, this is, I will show you. So what I have done, uh, Emmanuel, here is I have used my complete facial graft as a first layer, and then I have used an, an uh, let's say, mini uh, a pericranial flap. This is not something new. This is also from the Pittsburgh School, Eric, and uh, I find it very helpful. You see here the peri pericranial flap, and uh, you can mobilize it under the skin and in the area of the supraorbital rim, you bring then this flap inside the defect and then you have to use a fibrin glue. And what I routinely do is I use fat or I use surgical bolts hmm. to, to, to uh, support the edges, let's say, of my, of my uh, uh, defect closure. I found it very helpful. You see here how it is and then I have used, you will see it, I cannot run the the video, but it's, it's, it needs a few seconds. It finished. And uh, fibrin glue, and then on the, on the edges of my skull-based defect closure, I always use fat tissue or I use a, a, a surgical cell to, uh, to improve, uh, let's say, the pressure on my duraplasty of my skull-based defect. Also, and granulation exactly. tissue. Granulation exactly. Also, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, and this is uh, not. Uh, some, you see here the MRI six months later. You see the bulking on the on the ethmoidal roof. Let's say on the orbital roof. This is this is the paper. Okay, and what I found very helpful, and I have done it in two cases, is to make a window as uh, Philippe Hermann and uh, collaborators have described, to make a small window in the anterior frontal sinus wall, then to remove the mucosa on the posterior wall of the frontal sinus, and then you can bring all your pericranial flap on the anterior skull base. I found it very helpful, and this is, to come back to your uh, question, Manuel, this is a good alternative to make a bifrontal craniotomy and to, to, to use a neurosurgical uh, procedure. Thanks. Excellent, Janis. Questions from the floor? If that is not the case, I've had, had a pretty easy job with such a bunch of panelists here uh, exhibiting very good results. One question over there, burning question. Thanks. Oh, not really burning, but... Um, if it's uh, not I, burning, I saw uh, a lot of glues. Uh, are you familiar with the bio glue? It's, it gets really, really hard. It's sometimes it's also a possibility to close the leak. Bio glue. Bio glue. They use it in uh, thoracic surgeons for the. Mm -hmm. reconstruction Any of experience the with bio glue? I use glossy. No. Okay. Thank you. So again, thank you very much. Dear panelists, thank you for staying with us and enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>